Hello and welcome to Today's Veteran. I'm Kate West. On this episode, we'll hear from Lieutenant Colonel Scott LaRonde, the recently appointed commander of the Army ROTC Battalion at Florida Southern College, and one of the cadets in the program, Matt Leonard. Later in the show, Polk County Commissioner Ed Smith shares some memories from his 28 years on active service in the U.S. Navy. But first, stay tuned for an update on news and events in the veteran community. Fall in Polk County, your sit rep is to follow. For some people, a new year means a new beginning. For others, though, it's the start of another tax season. Veterans can breathe a little easier this spring because the Internal Revenue Service offers free tax preparation for veterans. In fact, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance and the Tax Counseling for the Elderly programs give free tax help to all taxpayers who qualify. Details can be found online at the IRS or VA websites. Residents in the Water's Edge community in Lake Wales wanted a flagpole to proudly and prominently display an American flag at the front of the campus. So they raised the money to make the dream a reality. A special dedication ceremony will be held on President's Day, February 18th, to raise the flag for the first time. Those who plan to attend the event are asked to wear red, white, and blue. Support Polk County's wounded veterans at the Healing Heroes Freedom Fest Motorcycle and Car Rally out of the Sun and Fun grounds on February 23rd. Enjoy music, vendors, a food truck rally, and special guest appearance from Ryan Hurst of the FX show Sons of Anarchy. General admission is just $5 at the gate or $3 with a military ID. Funds raised at this event will benefit the Healing Heroes Network, a nonprofit charity committed to providing financial assistance for medical care to military personnel who have been injured in the line of duty since September 11, 2001. Find out more about the Healing Heroes Network and available services at healingheroes.org. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta announced in late January that he would be lifting the ban that prevented women from serving in combat positions. Changes will not be immediate, but as service chiefs develop plans to move forward, these jobs are expected to be available for women to seek out as soon as this year, according to a statement from a senior Pentagon official. The services will have until 2016 to implement all the changes. It may be important to note that job requirements and standards are not changing. Instead, women will now be allowed to compete with men for positions for which they are already qualified. Women currently make up about 14% of the 1.4 million active military personnel. Lieutenant Colonel Scott LaRonde said, said this announcement will not change the way he runs the Army ROTC program of Florida Southern College because all of the cadets under his command receive the same training, regardless of gender. Let's hear more from LaRonde about the program at FSC and the upcoming Charles Rubidoux Memorial Golf Scramble. Since 1951, the ROTC program at Florida Southern College has been preparing officers for military leadership roles in, uh, in the Army. Joining us in studio is the, the commander of the ROTC program, that would be Lieutenant Colonel Scott LaRonde. He's a professor of military science. Thank, thanks for having me today. And also joining us is uh, Matt Leonard. Matt's a, a cadet second lieutenant. Uh, Matt, welcome to the show today. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. Guys, uh, thanks for coming on. I, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the rich uh, military tradition that, uh, that uh, Florida Southern ROTC program uh, has. We were talking a little bit off camera and uh, produced nine generals. Nine general officers. That's correct. Yeah. For, for a program that's not really as large as some of the major programs such as West Point or Texas A&M or VMI, uh, the program here does very, very well. Uh, and we've had nine general officers, uh, both in the active Army and in the National Guard Army Reserves, graduate from the program. Let's talk a little bit about now. Now, see, I couldn't help but notice you mentioned that uh, that that Texas A and M pr uh, program, and 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 you are an Aggie, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> had to get that in there. Didn't I you? did. I did. You know, <laughs> the whole Southeastern Conference invasion includes Lakeland. Just so you know, right? <laughs> well, well, Scott, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the program for those that that might you know might not know what exactly an ROTC program. What exactly? is it? 
Our program's mission is to, is to develop young leaders uh, to, for eventual commission into the United States Army, be that the active duty or the Army Reserves or the Florida National Guard. Uh, it's a four-year program. Uh, we like to have our young men and women join us when they're freshmen, uh, but they can join us later as the start of their junior year. Uh, and we teach them fundamentals of leadership. Uh, we teach them some basic military tactics, and we teach them team building and team development uh, activities. Uh, with the intent, again, of getting their confidence up, not only giving them problems to solve, uh, letting them to develop their own solutions, but then organizing and, and tasking and, and, and assigning responsibilities to other members of the team uh, so that they can accomplish the, the goals and, and the tasks that we gave them. Joining us also is, is Matt. And, and Matt, uh, from a student standpoint, uh, you being a, a, a cadet student, talk a little bit about what your day is like as, as an ROTC uh, officer and, and, and being a student, because yours isn't like everybody else's. <laughs> Not even close. Um, starts off with the alarm going off at five o'clock in the morning, uh, rolling off to PT. Um, some people would think, hey, that's hard to do, but um, it's, get me, it's got me in good shape. I'm pretty sure if I didn't have uh, that discipline, um, and, yes. and for the non-military folks, go ahead and explain to them at home oh, what PT is. Um, just physical training. Um, just getting there at 6 o'clock in the morning, um, going for a run, doing push-ups, sit-ups, just trying to get in the best physical shape that I can. Um, but after that is, then I continue on as a regular college student, going to classes, ensuring I have all my homework done. Um, the nice thing about this is, I mean, it's really taught me to have discipline, um, to stay ahead, not waste the last minute to finish my homework. Let's talk a little bit about uh, how that discipline uh, works into, you know, not only in your military career, but, uh, military career, but in, in your academics going forward with that. Um, how does it help you prepare for, uh, for uh, academically uh, challenges? Um, I mean, mostly just staying ahead, um, doing things early, not waiting until the last minute. Um, I mean, myself, as I'm a chemistry major, and uh, I have a 3.7, and so it seemed to work out pretty well so far. <laughs> Where do you foresee yourself uh, going out of uh, uh, leaving Florida Southern? Um, I, my branch is going to be uh, engineering. Um, I'll find out in about a month uh, when I'm going to my basic course and when I'm going to my unit, or where my unit is. Now, with, with cadets like this, mm -hmm. the job's got to be easy, but uh, you have to be commended yourself. Uh, been in the top 15% in the last two years. Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, it's a very good program uh, compared to uh, other schools in the region. Now, my region consists of uh, 39 ROTC programs from Louisiana up, in, up to uh, Tennessee. And uh, we typically rank in the top 10, top 15 percent. Uh, in our particular class, our mass particular class did exceptionally well. Uh, the Army ROTC program assigns a, awards a, a category called a Distinguished Military Graduate. And Distinguished Military Graduates are typically given to the top 20 cadet, top 20 percent of cadet graduates each year. Uh, Forty percent of Matt's class, including Matt uh, from Florida Southern College, graduated as distinct, will graduate as Distinguished Military Graduates. So we're doubling the national average in the program. For those at home, um, words like duty, honor, country, courage, things along that lines, they're just words, but uh, these are the values that you instill in these young officer candidates. Talk about the work that, that, that goes into to instilling those values into them. Well, it, it, oddly enough, it's not that hard. Uh, a large chunk of our cadets come from Central Florida. And, for, and I've, although I've only lived here about nine months, I noticed that that's not really hard for us to install in these. A lot of these, a lot of the young men and women from Central Florida and the other areas we have, they already have that sense of duty and honor. That's why they walk into our doors. Uh, so what we're really doing is refining and giving it a military meaning. Uh, and we like to also talk about uh, civil res civic responsibilities as well. Uh, but it's not a complete overhaul like it is maybe in some other programs. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the people that you get in, the, the officers, candidates, uh, are they, do they do their military commitment and they're done, or well, roughly percentage-wise, what are we talking about that, that make a career out of it? Well, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that, honestly. Um, from, from what I've seen, uh, it's probably around 40 percent total. Um, you know, the obligation is eight years, whether it's three years of active duty and five years of reserves, or eight years of active duty, or uh, all reserves. It depends on the, the contract you take uh, when uh, you're in ROTC. Uh, but uh, I think those kind of decisions are really individual decisions. Uh, from what I've seen uh, from this program, the graduates 
it's their choice what they want to do and a lot of them do pursue a career but I have several who work for me now who uh, graduated from the program uh, decided that the, a, a, an active career was not in their best interest uh, that their dreams lied elsewhere and that some of them work for me now here back at Florida Southern College. Talk about some of the values that they take out of the program even even if they don't make the the career mm -hmm. uh, uh, the military career talk about the values that, that they take out and and there are so many things I've, I, I had a nine-year career <coughs> nine and some change mm -hmm. and, and every day I still bring all those with me. Probably the one the most important value that I hope they take out is a sense of a, it's a sense of duty because duty doesn't end just when you're in uniform. Um, you have a duty, duty to vote. You have a duty to enhance or improve the quality of life in your community. You have a, a duty to volunteer. You have a duty to uh, espouse these values or advertise these values to the rest of our community. Uh, so whether we're in uniform or out of uniform, I think every uniform service member uh, or every veteran uh, has that sense of duty that doesn't ever leave them. Matt, what's it, what's it mean to you to, to put on that, that, that uniform, not only of, uh, of a cadet, but when you finish the program at Florida Southern, what's it going to mean to you to put on the uniform of the officer, put uniform of the officer of the United States Army? When I put on this uniform is I realize I'm representing more than myself. I'm representing the nation. Um, and then I'm also part of a brotherhood that I know anyone else in this uniform, um, they have my back. One thing about the, the program at, at Florida Southern, like we said, we have nine general officers come, come out of it. They're, it's rich in tradition, and uh, what's it mean to you follow, to follow in the footsteps of, of that? Oh, it means a lot. Um, I mean, this program has really trained me to be a good leader, and hopefully, I mean, I can be in the halls of Florida Southern as another great officer. Scott, uh, one of the, the names that, that came through uh, the halls at Florida Southern was uh, Charles Rubido. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Charles. Yeah, Charles was a, was a graduate of our program. Uh, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army. In 2005, he was killed in Iraq. Uh, so uh, every year, uh, to, to, to remember that sacrifice, we, have, we host a memorial golf tournament on the 22nd of March. Uh, with, the, with the intent of raising money for a scholarship that we award to a, a cadet uh, each year. Uh, Charles's family comes and they participate in the tournament with us and we get uh, businesses uh, and entrepreneurs from throughout the community will volunteer their time or their effort uh, to making this a really good tournament. Uh, this year Matt is actually heading up that golf tournament for us. Uh, all the organization for this tournament and a lot of and most of our activities in the program are organized and run by the senior class and uh, this is Matt's spring task this year is to make sure that that uh, tournament goes off without a hitch. And Matt you get to learn the greatest military term of all logistics. Mm -hmm. What's it take to put on an event like this? Um, a lot of work we actually started um, doing this uh, in um, December um, making sure that we had a place organized, making sure we're getting the food there, making sure we have the people there that um, we have people directing them to where they need to go, where they're so they're there at the right time. Um, the uh, this year is our eighth year of actually doing this, and uh, hopefully it'll be a great tournament. Let's talk a little bit. You, how many years have you been participating in it, and, and, and how have you seen it grow, and how have you changed it? The uh, this is our. Um, I've been doing for this you for, alone. Yeah, I've been doing this for four years. Um, ever since a freshman. Um, the, uh, it, it tends to change a lot every year. Um, last year was we actually had it at the Bartow Golf Course. Um, this year, like, he, like Colonel Ron was saying, we're having it at the uh, Cleveland Heights Golf Course. Um, every year it just seems to get better. Um, we learn off our mistakes and... Um, There's such a, a sense of pride when it comes to uh, our military members serving. And, and how, how do you foresee people getting out and, and serving this program, coming out and supporting this program, uh, how do you see them acting towards you know, uh, supporting this program? We actually get a lot of support from our alumni, um, whether it's donations or a lot of people come out and play. We have a ton of previous year participants. Logistically, here we go. If, if I'm interested, say I, I get a foursome out there, uh, how do I go about uh, becoming part of it? Um, you can sign up um, on, on the website at flsouthern.edu slash ROTC golf um, or you can call the department and we can give you more information there. And of course Scott mentioned that uh, sponsors are a big program. You guys still accepting sponsors? Yes. And how can they do as such? 
um, same way is either doing it online or calling the program. The cool thing about the ROTC program is you you have a a background that, that's helping support this, but the, you guys also need volunteers. Um, we we um, we have all the cadets volunteer, um, so we just love to have everyone out there to play or support us in any way they can. Same way that they can, uh, whether whether they can contribute financially or play in it, they, if they want to volunteer. Same context. Um, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, let's talk a little bit about sure. you got another event that uh, that you want to promote also. Yes, we do. Um, Florida Southern College ROTC is actually partnered with two other colleges here in town, uh, Polk State College as well as Southeastern University. Uh, Southeastern University's faculty is really looking to expand uh, the student participation in the ROTC program. As such, uh, they've developed a Military Appreciation Day, uh, the 12th of March. Uh, their varsity baseball team is having a doubleheader and they've designated that, uh, those games as a Military Appreciation Day. Uh, in coordination with us, we've, uh, we've, we've arranged to have the uh, Orange County Chopper that the U.S. Army had custom made. It's going to come out here and be on display. Uh, there's also going to be food and prizes and other, and other such items there at the game. We're hoping for a very good turnout. Uh, the focus is the idea to get students aware of the ROTC program, but more importantly of military service in general. And can anybody come out to it? Anybody can come out to it, absolutely. And it's a perfect opportunity to you, for you at home, come out, check out, watch some great baseball, and, uh, and say thank you to uh, uh, not only our future leaders, but I'm sure there'll be some veterans there, and, and, and say thank you to, the, to their service. It's, it's a very simple process. And, and Scott, uh, he, he is Lieutenant Colonel Scott Larone. He is the uh, battalion commander and professor of military science at Florida Southern. And of course, uh, Matt Leonard. Matt is a cadet, second lieutenant enrolled at Florida Southern College. Scott, I thank you very much for your service to this great nation. And, and Matt, I, I thank you very much for what you're about to do for this great country. Thank you. Thank you're you so always honor. welcome on today's thank, veteran. Thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, my name is uh, Ed Smith. I'm Polk County Commissioner representing District 3. And I'm a veteran of the United States Navy. I spent uh, 28 years on active duty, and 14 of those years were at sea uh, on six different ships. And uh, I think one of those most interesting tour I want to talk about a little bit was probably on board the USS LaSalle. U.S. LaS LaSalle was an AGF, as she was designated at that time, uh, which was a flagship. And she was the flagship of the uh, commander of the Middle East Force and home ported in Manama, Bahrain, which was interesting. And that meant that the flagship there never came back to the United States. It stayed over there in Bahrain, Manama, which was the capital city of Bahrain, which is an island in the Persian Gulf. So people would come aboard the ship and they stayed for one year and then they went back to the United States as individuals. And uh, so they'd just fly you in, you stayed there for your year and you left. Uh, the interesting thing was that on that particular ship, number one was the operating conditions, the heat, and uh, things that we just weren't used to. Uh, the city of Manama was very interesting just to walk around. It's almost like a, a different world, I guess you'd have to say. Uh, the most interesting part was the old part of the city, which was called the Souk. One of the things that was a big seller in Souk, of course, was gold. And if you went down on Gold Street, you could see the windows of every shop on both sides of the street as you walked by were just filled with gold. Uh, there were gold chains, there was rings, there was bracelets, everything imaginable, but everything was made out of gold. What the percentages of gold were, yeah, you might be unsure. That ship uh, was painted white which was very unusual. The only ship in the United States Navy that was painted white, and uh, that was because of the heat. I can recall one particular day, uh, I was a chief petty officer when I went aboard. I was in the chief petty officer's quarters, and I noticed, my goodness, it's getting kind of warm in here, and I went over and looked at the thermostat, and it was 80 degrees. I said, wow, the air conditioning must have stopped working. 
And that was fine until I went out on the quarter deck and I realized it was 135 degrees outside. So the air conditioning was doing just about all it could do. And uh, so that was one thing. When it came time for maintenance of the ship, we, uh, we had, a little, had a little bit of a difficulty there. Located in Manama was the Arab Ship Repair Yard, or as we called ASRI. They were qualified and set up, as a matter of fact, to do maintenance on commercial ships, not on Navy ships. So when we went in there, they could not work on any electronics. They didn't have that capability, but they could do engineering work, which meant pumps, valves, steam lines, those kind of things. They could, they could do that for us. Uh, one time we went into uh, the uh, African Marine Yards in uh, Mombasa, Kenya, and we got some work done there. And uh, at one time we went for one three week yard period uh, through the Suez Canal and up into Naples, Italy to the shipyard there to have some work done. Work on was kind of hard to get done on that ship though, it really was. Uh, a lot of things happened that were so interesting. We went to uh, Liberty Port one time at, in the Seychelles, which was a, just an absolutely beautiful place. Um, we were there, as a matter of fact, when the revolution was going on in Iran. The USS LaSalle removed the last American citizens out of Bandar Abbas, and we took them, picked them up, all the American citizens that were there, and transported them across the Persian Gulf over into a Saudi Arabian port, and they were flown back to the United States. That was a very interesting thing. And there are more things going on. Of course, I don't have time to talk about all the things that happened, but it was a very interesting tour. We were, we were in the Persian Gulf, as I said before. The entrance there, if you recall, is through the Straits of Hormuz, which is a very narrow passage, but one that is very, very busy with the oil tankers coming in and taking the refined uh, petroleum products from the big refineries in Bahrain uh, out through into the Indian Ocean and then to the rest of the world. So of all the tours I had on, on six different ships, as a matter of fact, that was, uh, that was probably the most interesting tour I had on that particular ship. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Scott LaRond, a professor of military science and battalion commander at Florida Southern College Army ROTC. In 2005, I was uh, in my first deployment in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. I was stationed in, in Kuwait and I commanded an intelligence detachment there. And one of my duties was to routinely meet with several Kuwaiti officials uh, and, and, uh, ex and exchange information with them. Uh, I was invited one night to this one gentleman's house. Uh, he invited me over for dinner uh, and uh, had established quite an elaborate spread. And we had a wonderful dinner and spending time with his family. And, uh, I was talking with him through a translator. We used his translator, who was a, a Sudanese, and he was six foot nine. A real nice gentleman, uh, but uh, he uh, wasn't necessarily a fan of his, of his boss. Uh, after dinner, the boss decided he, he wanted to uh, recite some of his own poetry that he'd written to me. And uh, so we, uh, he sat, we sat down uh, around, the, around the living room, and uh, the Sudanese translator uh, sat between us. And the, uh, the, the Kuwaiti man started talking and reciting his poetry. And he was getting quite moved by his own poetry, his own words. Uh, you can see it in his face. And he was getting kind of uh, very sad. And he was uh, really getting a bit emotional about it. Uh, but I was having a hard time maintaining focus on him. I don't speak a lot of Arabic. Uh, rather, I had, in this case, I had to rely on the Sudanese uh, translator, who was having a hard time keeping his composure because he kept laughing. And I couldn't figure out why the Sudanese man was laughing so hard. Uh, and the Kuwaiti man was uh, evidently quite emotional about his, uh, and he was about his poetry. And he was really getting uh, in, uh, excited about reciting his poetry to me. And I don't think he was realizing that uh, he completely lost his, his translator. Uh, so when he finished, uh, I, I was trying to be very respectful. Uh, I didn't mention without the translator. And the translator's just in tears. He's laughing so hard. Uh, but uh, I thanked the man for reciting his portrait to me. I told him it was quite wonderful and that I enjoyed hearing him talking about it and that I saw the passion uh, that he had for his poetry uh, in, in, in his language and in how he presented it. Uh, the Sudanese man just kept laughing. 
And uh, so after after that uh, after that interview was over uh, or that session was over, uh, the the, man, the Kuwaiti man excused himself, and I took the opportunity to ask the Sudanese man what was so funny. Uh, and his response was, uh, his boss is notoriously inept in poetry; uh, that his poetry makes no sense in either English or Arabic; uh, that the only person who appreciates his poetry is himself. And his in this particular case, the po the poem was so bad. Uh, that the Sudanese man had a very hard time uh, translating it with a straight face. And uh, so I, I walked out of that uh, experience uh, very thankful I didn't speak Arabic. I hope I handled the situation well, didn't cause an international incident, but uh, I'm not sure how long the Sudanese man ended up working for that uh, Kuwaiti gentleman. That's all we have for this edition of Today's Veteran. Next month, we will bring you more information about the partnership between the Polk County Adult Day Health Care Program and the Department of Veterans Affairs. Until then, catch up on past episodes of this show on the Polk County website and YouTube. Remember that for help and information regarding claims, benefits, and services available to veterans and their families, call the Veterans Service Office or log on to the Polk County website.